Has anyone ever told you the story of the mountain and the hound? Lovely little tale of brotherly love. On Game of Thrones, the will to violence is made visible and personified by one man. Gods, who's that? Sir Gregor Clegane. They call him the Mountain. The knight who's Tywin Lannister's enforcer and then Cersei Lannister's bodyguard is not a complicated guy. He's strong, angry, and loves to torture and kill. Does he frighten you so much? I'd be a bloody fool if he didn't frighten me. He's freakish big and freakish strong. The fact that he's drawn so simply, and even played by three different actors over the course of the series, makes him a walking symbol of violence and brutality. When Cersei utters her most defining line, I choose violence. That violence is embodied by the man beside her. Through the mountain's presence in the story, and the way he transforms from a mad animal to a cold zombie, Game of Thrones offers us a study of brutality and its impact on the world. Some lucky boys just born with a talent for violence. Before we go on, we want to talk a little bit about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a superb online learning community with thousands of classes about everything. Photography, illustration, music production. Click the link in the description below to get two months access to all classes for free. The defining aspects of Gregor's personality speak to the question of what violence is and where this impulse comes from. One of Gregor's fundamental traits is that he's full of rage. As a child, he stuck his brother Sandor's face in the fire just for playing with his toy. Gregor never said a word. He just grabbed his brother by the scruff of his neck and shoved his face into the burning coals. His servants have been known to go missing, and his sister and father also had suspicious deaths. There's an implication Gregor likely killed them and then inherited his father's estate. These stories tell us that, emotionally, the mountain is an overgrown bratty child who can't handle it when the tiniest thing doesn't go his way. I thought I stole one of his toys. I didn't steal it, I was just playing with it. So he illustrates the way that violence is born of anger. If we never learn to control or deal with not being able to have everything exactly as we'd like it, then we resort to force to make the world bend to our will. If we look closer at Cersei, who also chooses violence, we can see that she too is driven by rage. Her life has given her a lot to be mad about. Your sister was a corpse and I was a living girl and he loved her more than me. But Cersei's anger is more fundamental. It stems from her being born a girl in a world that detests women. You don't hurt little girls in Dorne. Everywhere in the world, they hurt little girls. And that anger intensifies after she receives the prophecy that traps her in a life of misery she's powerless to evade. Gold, the shrouds. The valid causes for Cersei's rage make her tragic. But whatever the cause, excessive anger is a kind of insanity. It reorients the entire world around oneself. No one walks away from me. She's framed everything in her head as a question of whether a person perfectly serves her. So even Jamie caring about the future of humankind is a betrayal. I pledged to ride north. I intend to honor that pledge. And that would be treason. This total self-centeredness leads ultimately to evil, as it seeks to violently remake the world according to one's whims, or else wills it to nothing. So I don't care about making the world a better place, hang the world. Despite the fact that he's a knight, the mountain is the most dishonorable man in Westeros, which symbolizes that there is no honor in violence. Who am I fighting? Does it matter? When we're introduced to the mountain at a joust in season one, he angrily tries to kill Loras Tyrell for outsmarting him by distracting his stallion with a mare in heat. Loras knew his mare was in heat. Quite crafty, really. So immediately, Gregor's character is established as a mean, sore loser. This is a cynical world that rewards Gregor's bad behavior with knighthood. But the fact that Gregor himself is so utterly disgraceful underlines that, though people make up falsely noble justifications and titles for their brutality, in reality, these dark impulses represent only the worst way any man can behave. The Mountain is also an alcoholic. See that he doesn't get drunk in the evenings. He's poor company when he's sober, but he's better at his work. And this reminds us of the way drinking can bring out rage and violence in people with those tendencies. The Mountain doesn't just inflict harm out of anger. He enjoys torturing and killing, telling us that violence can be addictive and yield a perverse pleasure. He has fun toying with the prisoners of Hall, 
After he carries out his orders to murder Rhaegar and Elia Martell's son and daughter, he chooses to rape their mother while he's covered in the gore of her dead children, before killing her. This relish for cruelty also reveals something important about the Lannisters. For them too, brutality is not just a means to the end. Tywin and Cersei take pleasure in hurting others. Only for them, psychological violence can sometimes be even more satisfying. Another thing we know about the Mountain is that he's not particularly smart. Does he understand what we're saying? I mean, to the extent that he ever understood complete sentences in the first place. So this tells us that pure and simple violence on its own isn't all that powerful. I wanted him to chase us, which he would have done because he is a mad dog without a strategic thought in his head. The Mountain's force has to be harnessed by the Lannister's intelligent strategy in order to become truly fearsome. While the Mountain is not the sharpest tool in the shed, generally, he does have an instinctive understanding of people's weaknesses, revealing that violence has an animalistic insight to it. One of the character's biggest moments comes when he fights Oberyn Martell in The Mountain and the Viper. Have they told you who I am? Some dead man! At first, Oberyn's agility and speed make the Mountain look slow and inept. Yet, in a stunning surprise, Oberyn loses at the last minute, when the mountain trips him and smashes his head in. The obvious explanation for why Oberyn loses here is his arrogance. He's the biggest man I've ever seen. Size does not matter when you are flat on your back. He puts on a show for the crowd, and he assumes the mountain is incapacitated too soon, underestimating a deadly foe. But the second explanation, and in fact, the true reason Oberyn loses, is his grief. You raped my sister. You murdered her. You killed her children. We see him start to get panicked when he thinks that the Mountain may die before admitting his war crimes against Elia Martell. Wait, are you dying? No, 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 you can't die yet, you haven't confessed. He's obsessed with getting the Mountain's confession and bringing down Tywin Lannister. Who gave you the order? And he starts to feel hysterical when he thinks the Mountain may die before providing this emotional closure. Say her name! So the Mountain seizes on Oberyn's desperation. He withholds what his opponent wants, stirring him into a terror. And then, as he makes his final move, he delivers that longed-for confession as a taunt to make the violence hurt even more, proving his innate instinct for how to destroy people. I killed her children, then I raped her, then I smashed her head. Like this. this moment of the mountain's victory is so bone-chilling because it reminds us that this is a world where justice is so often not served. Those who seek to right terrible wrongs are crushed, while the brutish evil violence that the mountain represents triumphs time after time. I always thought you had a talent for violence. Burn the villages, burn the farms. Let them know what it means to choose the wrong side. The way the Lannisters utilize the mountain reminds us that this is a family that rules via the implied threat of brutality. Seems every bad idea has some Lannister behind it. And some Clegane to help them see it through. In key moments of Lannister victories, the mountain is there. The figure's centrality to their regime exposes that while they claim nobility and legitimacy as rulers, they're essentially thugs. The rule of force is their bottom line. So I cut the blacksmith in two. So him take the head off a horse with a single swing of his sword. That sounds like someone we know. At first, the mountain is known as Tywin Lannister's Mad Dog. I've heard him called Tywin Lannister's Mad Dog. Tywin keeps his own hands clean, but he uses the mountain for the darkest, most evil acts imaginable to get his way. The mountain follows your orders. Of course I blame you. At the same time, Tywin is always strategic, so he will hold the mountain back from totally senseless violence. Like when he stops Gregor from continuing to torture and kill the prisoners at Harrenhal for no reason. You can afford to discard able young bodies and skilled laborers. Notice Tywin's logic here. He objects to these men being killed and tortured only because they have another usefulness to him. Later, when the mountain leaves Harrenhal, he executes the remaining prisoners, and we can infer that as the prisoners have no more use, Tywin either didn't mind or approved, as he must have assumed his mad dog would do this, even if he didn't directly order it. If the mountain committed an atrocity, it was with Tywin's at least his permission and, and possibly his direct command. After the mountain and the viper fight, Oberyn manages to get his posthumous revenge through the poison on his spear. As Tywin's now dead, Cersei gives Kyburn the go-ahead to bring Gregor back to life as a Frankenstein-like monster. The process 
may change him. Somewhat. Will it weaken him? Oh, no. Very well, then. The Mountain 2.0 serves as Cersei's loyal bodyguard. In the books, he has a different name, Sir Robert Strong. This zombie-like incarnation of the Mountain represents a new, more virulent version of violence. Whereas before he was the mad dog, the animalistic brute fueled by rage and bloodlust, now he's the quiet zombie, soulless, obedient, and even stronger than before. <laughs> This change reflects Cersei's brand of violence compared to her father's. It's quieter, more internal, yet even more cold-blooded and dangerous. Cersei's rage is like the green wildfire she uses to blow up the Holy Sept. It's not a hot red fire, but a cooler color. She's held in and controlled her feelings so it's less obvious. But thanks to this restraint, her rage has warped into something even more explosive and unnatural. In season seven, the mountain becomes an extension of Cersei's inner thoughts and feelings. When she considers killing Tyrion, the mountain steps forward, visualizing her anger and hate for her brother. Do it! Say the word. While her conflicting emotions hold her back from following through. Then at last, when she has Jaime as her only remaining ally, she pushes even him away. Are you going to order him to kill me? And keeps just the mountain by her side. And this symbolizes that she has given in so fully to her will to do violence on the world that this is the only part of her left. The Mountain's key relationship in the story is with his brother Sandor, aka the Hound. And these two brothers are bound by hatred. Press me to the fire like I was a nice juicy mutton chop. The Wounded Hound illustrates the psychological impact of violence on its victim. He displays symptoms of PTSD. Just as he bears the scars of what his brother did on his face, he carries the emotional scars deep within. But the worst thing was that it was my brother who did it. My father who protected him. Despite what an awful person his brother is, Sandor has watched Gregor become a knight. So because he's seen the worst of humanity in his brother and seen that worst thing rewarded in society, he believes two basic things, that people are fundamentally bad and that the worse you are, the easier it is to succeed in this world. The world is built by killers. As a result, the Hound gives up, retreating into hate and cynicism. And as much as he detests everything Gregor stands for, Maybe my life, sir. I'm not sir. For many years, the Hound embraces his own violent impulses and doesn't concern himself with honor, making him not much different from his brother, just another thug for the Lannisters. Does it give you joy to scare people? No, it gives me joy to kill people. He gets the Hound name not only because he's fierce, but also because he does his master's bidding without question. He ran, not very fast. The Hound may believe that he's just being honest in a terrible world. Plenty worse than me. I just understand the way things are. But he's become as bad as that world by not fighting it. So in Sandor, we see a profile of the victim of violence who tragically ends up adopting that violence as a result of their trauma. Hate's as good a thing as any to keep a person going. Better than most. Over time though, his cynicism isn't enough to swallow up his better nature. When he sees good people threatened, like Sansa and Arya, he reveals an instinct to do the honorable thing and eventually stops denying that it matters to be on the right side. The Hound's one great fear is fire, representing the way his childhood trauma continues to define him. Yet in season seven, he ends up again with the Lord of Light worshippers in the Brotherhood. It's my f***ing luck I end up with a band of fire worshippers. And Sandor sees a vision in the fire. What do you see? Ice. A wall of ice. So the symbolism here is that while he's been fleeing the source of his pain, in fact, the universe is pushing him to open up and look toward it. By finally facing the fire he's experienced, he has a breakthrough. He can at last look beyond his hurt toward a greater purpose. One of the main fan anticipations when it comes to the mountain is what's called the Clegane Bowl theory, which is basically just that the hound in the mountain will fight. Remember me? Yeah, you do. The two men are significant foils of each other, as the abuser versus victim, and as the unrepentant, dishonorable man versus the reformed, honorable one, who both share an inclination for violence. There's an interesting parallel in the fact that both brothers have very nearly died, or arguably have died, and come back changed. When I found you, I thought you'd been dead for days. The Hound was either comatose or actually did die before being mysteriously revived. I was gonna give you a proper burial and then you coughed. And the Mountain was considered a goner until he was revived by Kyburn's dark science. What did you do to him exactly? I haven't been able to get a clear answer. Oh, uh, 
a number of things. Yet while one has been brought back by an unknown higher power, presumably to serve a greater purpose, the other is revived by unnatural means, only to serve Cersei. The old Gregor doesn't seem to be fully there. If it please your grace, he has taken a holy vow of silence. He has sworn that he will not speak until all his grace's enemies are dead. One Reddit user theorized that when Sandor looked into the flames as a young child, he actually had a vision then too. He foresaw that one day he would kill his brother. According to this theory, this vision is the true reason Gregor attacked Sandor. And that's why Sandor says, It's not how it ends for you, brother. You know who's coming for you. You've always known. This would make Gregor much more like Cersei. His original anger would stem from powerlessness and from the terrible certainty of seeing a hellish future he can't escape. Looking into the red, sad-looking eyes of the new mountain, we might observe that the impulse to do violence betrays a deep inner hurt. We might even feel the slightest bit of pity for the despicable mountain. Because at his core, this man who is violence incarnate must be one big ball of constant, howling pain. You're even f***ing uglier than I am now. Have you always wanted to deepen your knowledge of film production, social media strategy, or Italian cooking? Would you like to learn how to mix music or develop games? Do you wish you knew how to sketch portraits? Skillshare can help you turn those intentions into something concrete. Here at The Take, we want to improve our animation know-how, and we're using Skillshare to do it. They offer more than 25,000 classes about any skill you might want to learn, all for less than $10 a month. Right now, you can get two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in our description below. So don't wait. Try Skillshare today.